welcome, guys. And uh, it's my privilege to, to be with you guys. And uh, let, me, let me do this. Let me bring us back up to speed on where we've been over the last few weeks since we started our journey back up again. Uh, so we started in the conversation of biology. And biology is asking the question of what's the origins of life and where did it come from? Um, now, in our first session on biology three weeks ago, I used the term the logic train. Uh, you may remember me referring to the logic train. The logic train is something I, I use to refer to a sequence of reasonings or a sequence of logic that is the result of a starting point. So if we start our logic in point A, it demands that we get to point Z. But if we start our logic in point A prime, it demands that we land, land in Z prime. So in, if you may remember back into the origins conversation, in the origins conversation, the main thing that, that we talked about was that the core question of origins is, do, does our life, is it designed and do we discover purpose or is our life accidentally caused and we can determine our purpose however and whenever we want to? So think of it from the most important questions. I told you guys at the very beginning of our unit, all the way back, all the way back last year, or at the beginning of the year when we started session one, um, that the first most important question that we answer is, is there a God? And then once we answer the, is there a God question, then we answer, where is the beginning of life? Where does it come from? What's the origin of life? So let me show you the logic train here just for a second. So the reason I bring this up is because we go into biology, and I hope you guys can see this if I'm close enough. We go to biology, and biology is going to ask and answer the question of origins. Where did life come from? Now, depending on how we answer the origins question, it moves us into the next phase of conversation, which is anthropology. Anthropology is the study of human beings. So once we ask and answer the, well, how did we get here? Then it logically moves us over into what is a human being and why are we here? Which is the question of purpose. I would say closely tied to anthropology is also psychology, which we talked about last week. Anthropology and psychology. Now notice each of these have a core question. So remember in our biology unit, how we said that if, if we answer the question to origins, life has a random unguided natural cause. It's not designed, it's not purposeful, it's an accident. We are a cosmic accident. Then when we move over here into the human being, the anthropology and psychology, and answer the purpose question, we're gonna answer it the same way. We're gonna say something like, well, purpose is whatever Oscar wants it to be and whatever Nancy wants it to be and whatever Rick wants it to be and whatever Charlie wants it to be. You do you, it's up, up to each of us. That's if we've randomly evolved here and we have no defined purpose. However, all the way back here at the origins, if I say no, life was created and has a distinct purpose that we discover, we don't define, we discover it, then suddenly when I move over to anthropology and human beings and psychology, right thinking and right humanity, then my purpose is not something I define, it's something I discover. Now watch this. Here's where the logic train gets important. Once we answer those two questions, it logically moves to the next place. Sociology, which is where we are tonight. Sociology is the study of human societies. It's what makes for a healthy society. Now, watch the logic train here. If we have a random unguided cause, we're accidents, cosmic accidents, biology. And if we as human beings define our own purposes, it's up to us, then what is a healthy society? Well, a healthy society is whatever we make it to be. Let's reverse that logic. If God made us, he started this, a human being is what God says he is, then societies are a collection of human beings and societies have defined purpose just like human beings. Why? Because all societies are, are collections of human beings. So the logic train, I hope that makes sense to you guys as we see. So what's gonna happen is our next three sessions, our next three sessions, we are going to, um, we're gonna spend our next three sessions talking about sociology. And the definition of sociology is this, what makes for a healthy society? What is sociology? Okay, and we're gonna answer what are the pillars established by God for a healthy society? And, and specifically in this session, we're gonna talk about what is the biblical worldview of a family? 
Now, in the next session, next week, we're going to talk about what is the biblical worldview of a church. And then the third session of the sociology study, we'll talk about what is the biblical worldview of a government. Okay? So these all three go to bed together as a package deal, and you'll understand why here in a second. But let's talk a little bit more specifically about sociology. Sociology, uh, uh, define a society as this, persons living together in an ordered community, simply put. Now, that's a broad definition. That broad definition could be applied to the city of Dallas, people living together in an ordered community. That could also be applied to your homeowners association if you have one in your neighborhood. People living together in an ordered community, community, common unity. Common meaning many in plurality, unity meaning oneness. So people living together in an ordered community. Now, sociology is the study of how we live together in those ordered communities. Um, it's more of a modern study. It wasn't something, there weren't like, there weren't PhDs in sociology three, four, five hundred years ago. People didn't think that way necessarily all that much. But in more recent years, people have really driven down and said, let's study societies. And it's really a study of human behavior collective human behavior. And so most of you on this call, when you went to college, you probably were required to take a class in sociology or psychology, intro to psych or intro to sociology. And you got to pick which one. Okay. Most people choose psychology because it's individualistic centered. I loved sociology because I love studying like people, like how humans operate together in mass, but they're all, they're, they're from the same beast. I mean, they grow from the same plant here. So the core question is what is a healthy society? Now, the key here is each, each worldview, each meta narrative interprets society according to the way it interprets humanity. So if it says humanity defines its own purpose, then it will say society defines its own purpose. But if humanity has a defined purpose, then society has a defined purpose, which of course the biblical worldview says that society has a defined purpose just like humanity does, okay? Now, the biblical worldview is this. Let's just go direct at it. Here's the biblical worldview. Um, uh, well, by the way, in naturalism, materialism, they're going to say humans are basically good, product of natural, unguided, natural causes. And if humans are that way and we're a collection of human beings, then societies are products of evolving human knowledge and morals and laws and needs. Now, there's a word you need to write down here under naturalism and materialism. Everyone write down the word utopianism. Utopianism. Utopianism is the belief of a perfect society. Utopianism. Now, that is a popular idea even today. It was a popular idea. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a, in the Enlightenment. He was a huge thinker that, that championed utopianism, but it's made a resurgence today. In fact, when we see a lot of uh, like justice movement needs, things like that, when people are talking about problems in our society, the solutions are like, if we'll just do this and solve racism, if we'll just solve this, then we'll have a perfect society. This is what we need to have a perfect society. Well, I've got bad news. As long as society includes human beings, it will not be perfect, period. So utopianism is the belief that we, if we work together, if we, if we love each other, if we're kinder to each other, if we you know, set aside religion or set aside party politics or set all these different things, if we just come together, we can have a perfect society. Well, that idea is the birth child, the logic child of naturalism and materialism as it's applied to society. Because if we are evolving as individuals and progressing and getting better intellectually, morally, then why not societies? Does this all make sense to you guys? Okay, great. So, but the biblical worldview is different. We're going to say we're made in the image of God, but we're morally broken from sin, created, broken, redeemed, restored. So if that's true about the individual, then that's also true about societies, meaning I can take societies and I can filter them through created, broken, redeemed, restored. How was societies created? Watch this. What was the first human society? The garden. People living together in an ordered community. The garden, God, Adam, and Eve were the first human ordered community. That's critical. Now we know that sin entered in and broke that. In fact, sin broke it so deeply that while they were an ordered community in a triangular form, God at the top as, as master and governor over it and provider, okay, as well as, as father in terms of the family role and the government role, okay, and then you have Adam and Eve as the stewards and the, and the caretakers, but when they sinned, it broke that whole thing. So the first broken human society was also in the garden. It was caused by sin. So if human societies break started with sin, 
We shouldn't be surprised by saying that the, the brokenness in Fort Worth and Dallas or whatever city you may be watching this from, the root of it finds itself in sin as well. So create a broken, redeemed, restore. Now, I'm often asked this by eighth graders, like, why did God make us? I mean, was he lonely? Was God up there lonely? I mean, he's like, man, I'm, I, you know, yeah, I can make some angels and he makes some angels. Well, they're not made in my image. I'm still bored. I'm going to make humans. That's not true at all. In fact, quite the opposite. God was not lonely at all. This is critical that you get this. The first human society is the garden, but the first society overall is the Trinity. Do not miss this. God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. I'll draw it. The eternal society is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's the eternal society. However, when God made us in his image, remember he made us in his image, he made us with God, Adam, and Eve. Wow, it's a parallel. It's almost like when God said, let us make man in our plural, our image, he was making a plural triune image of himself through human interaction. That's exactly the point. So God wasn't lonely up there. God has always existed in perfect harmony in a society within himself. And he takes from that society and says, if I'm going to make man in our image, they have to relate to one another because I relate to myself within myself in the triune being that I am. And so he makes the earthly society. Well, we know that with the garden break, um, when that happened, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. And then we know that the first broken family, the first broken family was Adam and Eve's family. Remember, not only did they run from God, but they produced two kids, Cain and Abel, one in which murdered the other. The first broken family goes all the way back to the garden. Sin separated society from its start. This is critical for us to understand. Now, fat put, if you push the fast forward button to where we are today, you get this. Sin is a, our society is a complex mixture of two things. God's image and human sin. When you and I look out in the world and we watch news, in fact, when we get off this call, I hope you, you know, sit down and watch the news or look at Fox News or CNN or C-SPAN or MSNBC or whatever you watch and look at it and you're going to see stories that are, that are telling about the brokenness in humanity and then you'll see stories that tell about the beauty of humanity. And humanity, human society today is a complex mixture of beauty and brokenness, of God's image and man and human sin. And that's the, it's a gross soup mixture, and that's what we live in. Now, so what are the pillars? What did God establish to be the pillars that hold up a healthy society? They're threefold. They're threefold. Family, church, and government. There's threefold pillars that hold up a healthy society. So if you think of society like this, medicine, uh, technology, education, all of these different things that are included inside your society, commerce, all that, think of it as this giant, giant beam, but it has to be supported by three things. Family, church, and government. If you take away any of these three pillars, if you take away one or any of these three pillars, society breaks down. We see instances, corporate sociological instances, even inside scripture, we see it. We don't even have to look to scripture to see this. You take one or, one or more of those pillars out and it breaks down. Let me, let me put it this way, okay? If you took the family out of society and abolished all families, there was no family structure in the United States of America, the, the society would eventually break down. Not immediately, but it would eventually break down. Okay? All right? Watch this. If you took government out of society and we went total anarchy tomorrow, society would instantly break down. But if you took the church out of society, the society will ultimately break down. All three of these have vital responsibilities inside of society. And so our next three sessions, I'm going to talk about what these are and what they're not from a biblical worldview. Let's cut through the noise and the clutter and go, okay, this is what it is. Tonight, we're specifically talking about the family as it relates to the family. So before I go any further, I want to tell you, I'm just going to be very transparent with you. 
I, I'm a little scared. I'm personally a little scared. I work with hundreds of teenagers, hundreds, and I've been working, I've worked with teenagers for 20 years, okay? Typical, average, everyday American Christian, I said Christian teenagers. I'm not talking kids who've never gone to church. I'm not talking kids whose parents don't get, you know, care about God. I'm talking Christian teenagers, and I'm seeing, I'm seeing five things. Here's the five things I'm seeing from Christian teenagers today from good families. Here it is. Number one, I see from them a limited view of Jesus. They have a very limited view of Jesus. What do I mean? I mean, most of them, when I meet them, their view of Jesus is I pray a prayer. I get to go to a place when I die. And if there's anything you've learned from me in this worldview journey, Jesus is infinitely more. He's not something. He's everything. He's my economic guide. He's my philosophical guide. He's my ethical guide. He's my everything. And so kids are coming to me and they have a limited view of Jesus. And this is from good Christian families. They have a limited view of Jesus. One of the main reasons is because we've, we've sold them on pray this prayer and go to a place instead of in, infusing created, broken, redeemed, restored over every part of their lives. Second, Here's what else I'm seeing. I'm seeing among Christian teenagers, Christian teenagers, an avoidance, a, a, uh, an avoidance view of adversity. There's a high avoidance view of adversity. So when Christian teenagers face hard times, when they get rejected by a classmate because of their faith, um, when they deal with uh, some measure of persecution, when they deal with any kind of bullying, all that, they run from adversity as fast as they can. Absolutely as fast as they can. Many Christian teenagers that I encounter, they've grown up in the church and they believe that life should be fun and easy. Now, I'm going to tell you between you, me, and the fence post, because it's just us on the call, one of the main reasons is because a lot of the preaching they've sat under has all been about how to make your life fun and easy or help you get through your problems. So as a result of it, we've imbibed an assumption that it's all about me having a good, healthy, easy, successful life. Okay, here's the third thing that I've seen among many Christian teenagers today. I see a self-improvement view of the Bible. They approach the Bible with self-improvement. So they've got a problem, they'll open up to the book of Proverbs uh, because maybe I can get some answer in Proverbs. And while that's true, that's not the truest use of the Bible. The Bible is not meant to be just a self-help textbook. The Bible is meant to be a a, a guide for a holistic worldview to help us live rightly. In fact, in scripture, we're told that in Christ, we have everything necessary for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. And we have Christ Jesus revealed to us in the scriptures. And so kids, the Christian teenagers I work with, they have this self-improvement view. So if you ask them, why should we read the Bible? And they'll say it's to be a better person. Then have to do with knowing God more intimately, knowing him correctly, uh, worshiping him rightly. It's to be a better moral person. So they've boiled the Bible down to moralistic teachings. You know, I, there's this Bible um, that my kids were given, my, old, my oldest daughter, she was given when she was uh, young, very, very, very young. Um, a church leader gave it to us, and it was a, uh, like a beginner's Bible. Every one of the stories, it had beautiful illustrations, all that, every one of the stories boiled the Bible stories down into a moral David and Bathsheba had nothing to do with David's unfaithfulness to his covenant and his role as king, and it had to do with self-control. David and Goliath had nothing to do with God's great triumph in worship. It had everything to do with standing against your enemies or standing against uh, adversity in life. Think about this for a second. Boiling it down to moralistic. And so, so boiling it down to moralistic ideas. The fourth thing I'm seeing, this is very dangerous, I see among teenagers today, Christian teenagers, a consumerist view of the church. The church is a place where they go and they get goods and services. And if that pastor's not funny, if that pastor's not entertaining, I'll go down the street to another church and find someone who is. I'll go to a podcast and find someone who is. And, and just imagine if you push the fast forward button on a consumerist view of the church on the Christian teenagers today, and you fast forward that into their 20s and 30s and 40s, when they have kids themselves, it's going to produce church hoppers. Not church men and church women, but church hoppers, okay? Finally, 
here's fi finally, I see among Christian teenagers today a transactional view of relationships. It's very transactional. What can you do for me now? And if you're not doing anything for me now, I don't see any benefit from this now, I'm out. Now, I want you to imagine, what if someone takes a transactional view of relationships into marriage? It's not going to last. So, did you, I hope you caught a theme here. I'm not talking about cloud teenagers. I'm seeing this among Christian teenagers. So why do I bring all this up? Because it would be easy to, in a worldview study, when I'm getting ready to talk about the family, to go, listen, wise guy, I got a good teaching on the, I know a lot about the family. I've read what the Bible says about the family. I know what the Bible says about the church. I'm diligent inside my church. Maybe there's some things that we've missed. Maybe there's some cultural assumptions that we've digested and we don't really realize it. If you go back to my first session that I taught you guys all the way back months ago, I talked about the cloud, the cloud metaphor, where we're up on a mountain. I was up on a mountain and a cloud passed through and I literally was in the, in the fog of the cloud for 10, 15 minutes. And when it passed through, I looked down at my clothes and there was residue of the cloud all over me. This is important. We understand family and whether we realize it or not, we even Christians, we have residue of the cloud in terms of how we raise our families. We've bought into cloud assumptions about our families. I'm going to show you in this session, okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. You, you may not like me at the end of the session, okay? I'm not intentionally trying to offend anybody. I want to call us back to what the scripture says and where the scripture calls out something that needs to change in our lives. Let's humble ourselves and let's change. Where the scripture affirms what we're doing, let's receive that affirmation and not grow weary in well-doing. Let's bring repentance and gratitude for his revelation and walk forward with a, a biblical worldview. So, so the, the three pillars God has established as society could be healthy, family, church, and government. Tonight, we're talking about the family. So what is the biblical worldview of a family? Well, let me stop and say this. Here's where the cloud has taken over. When I sit down and I talk with Christian teenagers and I'll say, what's the purpose of your family? Most of my kids will say to raise us. Think about that for a second. If the purpose is to raise a child, then once that child moves out of our house, does the family no longer have purpose? Does it cease? Is it over? Well, certainly not. We know that the purpose of families matter for generations. Like, you know, the scripture talks about, you know, we're told that Jesus is gonna, through Abraham, Jesus is gonna bless every, every family under, under the stars. Okay, so families and God sees things very generational. Okay, so most kids bought, have bought into a human-centered definition of the family. And who can blame them? Because everything in their home is ordered around their schedule. Everything. Sometimes even church is ordered around the kids' select volleyball or you know, dodgeball or underwater basket weaving schedule. When everything is ordered around the kid, Kids imbibe a understanding that the family exists for me. And what will happen is they'll grow up, they'll get married, they'll have kids, and they'll create another family that exists for their kids. And it'll be go on and on and on until someone breaks the cycle. That is a cloud understanding. It's a human-centered view of the family. Well, God has a God-centered view of the family. A God-centered view of the family looks like, a, looks like this. The simple purpose is glorifying God. The family's job is to glorify God by building whole human beings who live out divine purpose and contribute to society. The purpose of the family, according to God's design, is to glorify God by building up whole human beings who live out divine purpose and then contribute to society. They don't just get jobs, they contribute. We'll talk about that. So think of it this way. Um, you know, I've talked to you about the postures of truth. I talked to you extensively about this in philosophy. There are only four postures toward truth, right? You guys remember these? We're either living in harmony with truth, living in rebellion to truth, confused about truth, or ignorant about truth. Well, this definition of family, glorifying God by raising up whole human beings who contribute, who glorify God and whole, by, uh, uh, whole human beings who live out divine purpose and contribute to society, we're either living in harmony with it, rebelling against it, confused about it or ignorant of it. A lot of Christian families that I've worked with, they're confused about it. Honestly, I would put a, a lot of Christian families in the confused category. We know we're supposed to glorify God. We don't know what that looks like in the home. We don't know what that looks like in the dinner table. We don't know what that looks like driving down the road to practice. 
Okay, so there are three major functions that I'm going to deal with tonight. Three major functions in the family. First is providing basic, basic physical and emotional needs for individuals. Okay, I'm going to list all three and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to go do a deep dive on each one. First one is provide basic physical and emotional needs for individuals. The second one is educate individuals into healthy adulthood. And the third one is release whole adults and new families back into society. So it's basically, it's, it's provide, educate, and release. Provide, educate, and release. Let's look specifically at provision, about providing for our families. Okay, now this may go without saying, and most of you on this call, you're probably like, listen, I provide for my family. I work very hard. Um, I mean, I work two jobs to, oh, I get that. I'm not denying anyone's provision here, but we want to make sure that we understand it rightly. See, provision, watch this. Let's keep this in mind. God is the ultimate provider of our needs, not you. The ultimate provider of the needs of my kids is God, not me. I happen to be a pipeline through which God provides the needs of my kids. Do not miss that point. Because if you miss that point, you and I, especially, you know, I, I don't know, you know, anyone on the call, I, it, it, like uh, any of the men on the call, I feel a weight of responsibility to provide for my family, make sure my family has everything that they need. Now, there's a healthy truth there. As the father in the home, I have a responsibility of provision, but I have to remember as the father of the home that I am not the ultimate father of my home that I am a pipeline through which provision passes through to my kids. Because if I don't ever teach my kids that God is the ultimate provider of my needs, then I'll never set them up to release them out into the world so that they will rely on the Heavenly Father for all of their needs in the future. So ultimately, God is the provider of our needs. Matthew 6, 24 and 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? By the way, the people Jesus was talking to at the Sermon on the Mount when he said this, heads of homes, fathers and mothers. And he told them not to worry about the provision. He told them to trust their heavenly father and they were probably worried about how they were going to feed their kids having walked with Jesus for three or four days listening to this amazing teacher teach. And he told them, don't be anxious about it. This is as relevant now as ever. Now, what I'm gonna do in each of these three functions of the, of the family, provide basic physical and emotional needs, I'm gonna show you some broken elements that I experience working with teenagers today, Christian teenagers. I experience two broken things, okay? Here's the first broken thing I experience. First, over-provision. I experience over-provision with, with kids that I work with, okay? Let me show you what I mean. Have you ever heard this phrase? I just want my kids to have more than I had. You ever heard that? Have you ever said that? Where did that, can you turn to the Bible passage where it says that, that we're supposed to give our kids more, more material things than we had growing up? It's not found in the Bible. In fact, that was found in the Great Depression generation. The Great Depression generation walked through incredible travesty. My grandma was a Great Depression child, okay? And legend had it, you know how family and great-grandparents and grandparents' legends go, right? Legend had it that grandma, grandma was one of nine, okay, with five girls. Legend had it in her family that there was one pair of shoes, one pair of shoes that all five of the girls shared during the Great Depression. Wow. So when my grandma passed away, when my grandma passed away in her 80s and we cleaned out her closet, we found 30 plus pairs of shoes in her closet, some of which had never been worn. Grandma liked her shoes when she got her job and moved out of the Great Depression. Now, why do I bring that up? Because sociologically, guys, we parent our kids in response to the experiences we had growing up. If, if our father was too harsh to us and yelled at us all the time, maybe we're real gentle and we will never raise our voice. Maybe if our dad was aloof and separate and disconnected and not involved, maybe we came down and we control everything. 
We parent in response to how we were parented. And what happened was a lot of Great Depression generation parents, because they lived with so little, they said, my kids will never suffer again. My kids will never go out. It's almost like Scarlett Johansson in Gone with the Wind, right? Remember in that final scene, she says, I will never, by God, I will never be poor. It, it's, it's that urge and that prompting, even though that's a period piece from earlier, there's a lot of people who can resonate with that. And when they parented from that, they just wanted their kids to get good educations and do whatever it took so that they could have more financially than they had growing up. I just want you to have more than I had. Now, watch this. What if you're on the call uh, right now and you're a doctor? You're a medical doctor. You are at the top of American earning society. I know there's business leaders that make way more than you. I know that. Entrepreneur, I know that. But if you look at education, you're at the top of education. You've got a terminal medical degree. You, you make at the top of, of like, I mean, you're well, well above, well above middle income, well above middle, middle class America. And if you take that philosophy of, I just want my kids to have more than I have, and you impose that on your kids and you provide them at that level with cars and clothes and everything under the sun, how will your kid rise up to make more than you and have more than you and live that out if God tells them to be a public school teacher? Watch this. Over-provision can set our kids up for failure in obedience. When I do this exercise with kids all the time with our eighth graders, I'll have them close their eyes and envision their first house when they get married and they buy their first house. Can you guys remember your first house? Okay. It probably was about from here to here, right? Your first apartment. Remember that? When they close their eyes and they envision their first house, do you know what it looks like? It looks eerily like the house they live in right now that mom and dad provided for them. But you know what they don't realize? It took mom and dad 25 years in industry and four house mortgages to get that house. So they're envisioning their first house looks like mom and dad's latest house. There's a gap here. It's something we have to be mindful of. Now, it's nowhere said in the Bible, I just want my kids to have more than I have. That's nowhere in the Bible. That's a cultural imbibed idea, cloud idea. But the Bible does teach this, contentment and gratitude. That is in the Bible. So in all of our provision, in all of our basic physical provision for our kids, we need to be cultivating contentment and gratitude. Contentment and gratitude. What does it mean to be content? What does it mean to be content with something small? What does it mean to be content with something big? How can we be grateful for a, a, and understand the value of something that is lavish? And how do we understand the value for something that is simple but important and necessary? You know, I had this dad, he came to me, I was teaching this session and he came up to me afterwards. Um, and he, a very wealthy man, um, very successful in the oil industry. Um, he had a, had a 16 year old son bought him a brand new truck, okay? Bought him a brand new, brand new truck, um, and he came up to me and he said, he said, Brand, he came up almost in tears, and he got done and he said, Brandon, he said, I've given everything to my kid, everything to my kid, everything he's ever needed, and and everything he's ever wanted, and he's 16, he's intelligent, and I can't get him out of bed to mow the grass, and he looked at me and he said, This, my son is a monster of my own making. I was blown away by his humility. Now, I tread lightly here because my kids are not through the teenage years. I know it's a battle. battle. Guys, I know it's a battle. But you have to understand, in a lot of areas in the DFW Metroplex, there's a lot of wealth in the DFW Metroplex. And there's a lot of wealthy pockets. And one of the most common things that kids talk about, one of the most common things that 15 and 16-year-olds talk about in it, you know, in Highland Village and Grapevine and Coppell and South Lake and you know, all these different areas in this area, you know, Alita, all these different areas. One of the most common things 15 and 16 year olds talk about is what kind of car they expect their parents to buy them when they turn 16. Turn to the passage in the Bible where it says that you have to provide your kid a car at 16. It doesn't even say provide him a camel. It's not there. Do you know where we drank that? From the cloud. I'm not saying don't buy our kids a car. I'm not saying that. 
I'm saying zero our attention in on gratitude and contentment. That's what I'm saying. And whatever it takes to teach our kids gratitude and contentment is far more important than them having more than we had. So here's the second thing I see that's broken in provision. Now, physical provision is not the only thing. Physical provision is not. Imagine if, imagine if there was a dad out there who all he did was he had a good job. He gave his kids everything they needed. They had food on, their back, food on the table, clothes on their back, a warm bed, and they had a good education. But there was nothing emotional going on at home from dad to the kid. Okay. Now, when I say that, some of you on this call, sadly, I'm talking about the home you grew up in. And the reason why is because there was another generation of men in America, the World War II generation, in which my grandfather was in a, my grandfathers were both amazing veterans of World War II, Army and then the Navy. And they fought in that. But that was a generation that they, as men, you don't talk about your emotions. You don't emote. And because you don't emote, when your son or your daughter's hurting, you don't walk down and say, I love you. you say, get up, you little pansy. You know, you, you, you're emotionally detached because emotions were my wife's job. Okay, she did the spiritual thing. She did the emotive things. I provide. I'm the breadwinner. I put the food on the table. Guys, this is unbiblical parenting. And some of you guys have scars from that parenting. I'm not insulting your dad or mom. I'm not insult, insulting your upbringing. But it's real in that the Bible says there's more. Let me show you. We have physical needs, but we also have emotional needs. You know, one of the great attributes that's talked about by about God is God is our comforter. God is our comforter. That's not a physical thing. That's an emotive need. So God is not just my physical provider. He's also my comforter. So I get my physical needs from God met, and I get my emotional needs from God met. But remember the pipeline. I mentioned me being a conduit or a pipeline for God's physical needs. Watch this. I'm also a pipeline for the emotional needs of my kids. Affirmation, acceptance, encouragement, correction, all of which is to come from God through me to my kids. But here's what's broken. Here's what's broken. Every human being has an emotional pipeline. I want you to imagine you've got a PVC pipe attached to your heart, and that goes upward. Okay. And when it's healthy, God is pumping in acceptance and affirmation and all that kind of stuff. But when there's a kink in that pipe, well, there's something that's clogging that. And we're not getting everything that God, who God is. We're not taking it from God. We go and we look for it in other places. Here's what I see in American homes. And here's what I grew up in. And I want us to look at this in terms of uh, emotional needs, because this directly affects the biblical worldview and the healthy development of our young people. So there's three pipelines. Pipeline number one, P1, is what I call from heaven to home, okay? From heaven to home. You have God. G represents God. It flows down. You have P represents parent. And then you have K represents kid. So this pipeline looks something like this. The kid says, Daddy, thank you so much for... Um, for, for that birthday gift, or thank you so much for what you gave to me. Son, I want you to know, I, I gladly would give the world to you, but I want you to know this. Ultimately, I didn't give it to you. God gave it to you. Why? Because God gives me everything I have to provide for us. My talents and abilities, I didn't make them on my own. God entrusted them with me. And as I work those talents and abilities, I get money. I get compensated for that by society. That's the way it was designed to be. So when you get something from my hand, you must understand it ultimately came from God's hand. And he loves you more than I ever will. Buddy, I forgive you, but he forgives you infinitely. I love you, but he, he loves you infinitely. That's the pipeline as it's meant to be. And I'll tell you why that's so important here in just a second. But here's pipeline number two. Pipeline number two is, uh, is what I call uh, from home to humans. home to humans. So here's God up here, who's ready and willing to provide physical and emotional needs for the kid, but there's a break somewhere between God and the parents, okay? And so you have the parent, and the parent is pouring out love and affirmation and acceptance to the kid themselves. You go, well, Brandon, what's wrong with that? I mean, parents are supposed to love and accept their kids. You're exactly right, but here's the problem. Parents are temporary. If this thing goes as planned, my kids will bury me, not the other way around. And if they only learn 
that daddy is where acceptance comes. Daddy is where compassion comes. Daddy is where wisdom comes. They haven't learned to depend on their heavenly father. Here's what's so tricky about these two pipelines. Here's what's so tricky. These two pipelines look the exact same on Sunday morning. Good church people in both pipelines. I'll tell you this, growing up, I grew up in pipeline number two. I always knew my dad and mom loved me, always knew they loved me, I always knew they cared for me, um, I always knew they accepted me, I always knew that. But I can count on one hand, on one hand, the times that my parents prayed with me about anything in the first 20 years of my life. And I'm talking on that one hand, there's like two or three obligatory Thanksgiving meals. You go, oh, you, so you guys were godless heathens. No, we were good church members. We attended church pretty regularly. The difference is my parents had American Christianity where it was something we did on Sunday, but nothing on Monday through Saturday. It never made it home. And so as a result of it, ready, I'd go on Sunday and get some moralistic education. My parents would buy into some moralistic education that happened to mention Jesus. But when it was Monday through Saturday, I was on my own to find it wherever I could. This is home to humans. Now, why do I call it home to humans? Watch this. Because when pipeline number two is lived out, when pipeline number two is lived out and the kid moves out of the home or the kid is away from the home and the source of affirmation and acceptance is not there, they go and look for it somewhere. They go and look for it in other humans. Why? Because that's where I got it in the first place. Guys, there are so many young teenage girls and young teenage boys that live in pipelines like this at home and they are looking for romance and they're looking into romantic relationships in their teenage years for this love and acceptance. They always got it from their parents. They were never connected up to their ultimate source. They don't know where to go to get it ultimately. And they, in that teenage girl, she just knows that boy calls me special. Therefore, over time, we've gotten into a relationship where we do anything he wants. Home to humans. Because we don't grow out of our need for our emotional, for our emotional pipeline. Okay, here's the third pipeline. Pipeline number three. Pipeline number three is what I call none at home, seek and find. Okay, none at home, seek and find. Not only is there a break with God, there's a break with parents. Okay. This could be a, a home where parents are not available. Now, this could be a home where maybe a kid grows up in a, a foster care situation and there's no love and acceptance, but it could also be a home, listen, it could also be a home where parents are at home physically, but they're detached emotionally and on their phones all the time. Because what will happen here is this kid it is, we are wired inside of us to need this. We have this need for love and acceptance and affirmation. We don't grow into this. We are made with this. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that God made us with love cups inside of us? And yet he himself is love. It's almost like God made us to where we are only satisfied in thee. Blaise Pascal said that. My heart longs and is, is desperately lonely and wrestling and, and restless until my heart finds satisfaction in thee, okay? So we have the seek and find. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the seek and find is that that pipeline is growing. I mean, that, you know, bro, you've got a broken home situation or you have a uh, disconnected and detached parent situation. And so the kids are going to find it somewhere. Um, if you know anything about Wiccanism, um, I've, I've over the years, not at, not at faith at the school that I teach at, but when I was a student pastor, I worked with kids who were Wiccan. Okay. And um, one of the things, one of the things about kids who are Wiccan is if you know anything about it, it's a very fast growing cult in America, a very fast growing cult in American culture. And if you know a little bit about their demographic, most Wiccans, most Wiccans, the Wiccan priests are young 20 somethings. You're not talking 60 year old Wiccan priests. I mean, you can find some out there, but they're mainly young 20-somethings. They're young 20-somethings who were disenfranchised, disengaged, and isolated and left by themselves in their high school years, and they were embraced and accepted by other Wiccans. 
And through that acceptance, they found, they found acceptance, they found community, um, they found status, they found position, they found, I mean, listen, the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone and humans are desperately lonely. We will find it anywhere, even in a cult. And what ends up happening is, do you know who the number one, the, the demographic, the number one demographic of converts to Wiccanism is? High school kids. You know what kind of high school kids? Disenfranchised ones. Why? Because it's not about Wiccanism. It's not about ultimate truth. It's about a need for acceptance and love and affirmation. So we have these three pipelines. Guys, the first pipeline is God's design. This is how he meant it to be. He meant everything in our home to be training the kids back toward God dependence. So in theory, if a kid's willing, if a kid's willing to accept and live within this pipeline, when that kid grows up, they will ultimately grow up knowing how to depend on God themselves. This will produce a God-dependent human being. If the kid is willing, okay, kids can rebel. I'll talk about that here in a second. If a kid's willing, it will produce a God-dependent human being. That is the goal of, that's the goal of our faith. And that's the goal of our home. I want to produce God-dependent human beings. I told this to a group of moms one time. I told this to a group and, and they like, it shocked them for a second and they had to sit back and think about it. I said, if you want, when your daughter's going through her hardest day at, at, at whatever college, at Blank State University, if you want to be her first call, the first person she reaches out to, shame on you. You should want to be her second, God first, then you. And a lot of us, we want, you know, sometimes we want to have this esteemed position in the lives of our kids, which is good. It isn't a, necessarily a bad thing, but the best thing is, okay, what is God saying to you in this? What is, how, how is God helping you walk through this? Like, what do you feel like God might be teaching you through this? Okay, and so it produces this God-dependent kind of kid, if they're willing, if they're willing. Watch this. This pipeline, if we're trained by this pipeline, creates human-dependent people. People that are human dependent and un uh, sometimes unhealthy emotional codependencies, okay? This is one of the reasons, this is, by the way, this is an undercurrent reason why cohabitation is on the rise in Christian churches. Because we haven't learned how to depend on God the Father for our acceptance and aff affirmation. We only know how to find it in other human beings. Because most people are not growing up in pipelines that scream, God, 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 God. He is our source. Okay. Now over here, seek and find. This produces, this produces self-dependent human beings. Don't miss that. God-dependent, human-dependent, self-dependent. I don't need anyone. You can't tell me what to do. I don't need God. I don't need religion. I can live all on my own which is an exact opposite of God's first diagnosis of human beings. It is not good for man to be alone. So here's good news and bad news. And I always tell this to eighth graders. Here's the good news and bad news. I'll give you the bad news first. The bad news is you can rebel against your pipeline. A kid can rebel against their pipeline. I can name tons of godly parents who pointed their kids to God in every way. And I'm not talking, you know, like, weird, like awkward transitions and, you know, like, like hand me the Cheerios. Oh, look, there's a hole in the Cheerios. God is holy too. Did you know that? I mean, I'm not talking like weird like that. I'm talking, I'm talking humble, you know, parents where the kids got to see the parents walk by faith and praying and fasting and meditating, not on display, but real authentic. I've seen kids rebel against that. The bad news is kids can rebel against that. So wherever you are on this call, many of you have kids. If you have a kid that's rebelling against it, I'm so sorry. And, and as you evaluate this, do not beat yourself down. Kids can rebel against this. Now, here's the good news. You ready? And I'm telling this to eighth graders. The good news is you can rebel against your pipeline. Wait, I thought you said that was bad news. I did. It's also good news. Here's why. I could line up for you 25, 25 amazing godly young men and women who rebelled against pipeline two and three, found Jesus, met Jesus, learned God dependence on their own, and are setting a new generational cycle in their marriage and their parenting. Hi, I'm Brandon, nice to meet you. I grew up in pipeline number two. What pipeline did you grow up in? So this is serious business, guys. And one of the, you know, so the two things I see is, 
I see an over provision, but what I see in broken emotional pipelines is I see, I think the most common pipeline, even in American Christians is pipeline number two. I think it's pipeline number two, because I think, I think we've let, and we've expected our pastors to disciple our kids for us. So we've stepped away from that. We haven't pressed into that and gotten trained ourselves with that. And so we've struggled. Okay. Um, so, so this is important. So the first one is our provision. We need to make sure it's not over provision, training, contentment, and gratitude, giving them what they need because God is a good giver. God gives us what we need. God doesn't hold back from us what we need. He doesn't give us a serpent when we ask for bread and he doesn't give us a stone when we, when we ask for fish. Okay. He, he gives us good things and he gives us enough. And sometimes he gives us abundance. Okay. But the second thing we need to do is we educate individuals into healthy adulthood. The family's job is to educate individuals into healthy adulthood. Every word I said there is very intentionally chosen into healthy adulthood. Here's what I see that's broken in this. And I say this among Christian families. Um, there is a, a view of fragmented education. Education today is fragmented, meaning Meaning we teach people um, in, as far as education is concerned, what we do is we teach people, we, we believe like we should teach our kids reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? The four, the four R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's great. Okay. But where's, where's character training? Where's interpersonal relationship skills training? Where, where's all these other things? Okay. And if, if I can, guys, I can line up, I know national merit scholars, national merit scholars, who flunked out of college because they drank themselves stupid and they're 29 and at home living on their parents' couch. National merit scholars. Intellect is not the only component we're dealing with here. There's more at play. And we, because we understand a biblical worldview of humanity that we are parts made whole, we're unified whole beings, that my kid is not just an intellectual thing that needs to be educated, he's also an emotional thing to be educated. He's also a physical thing to be educated. So education, um, you know, we, we, our culture has approached this uh, fragmented view of education. For instance, like in many schools, especially a lot of public schools, there are things they can't talk about. I mean, you're like, there, there are borders. You can't talk about that there. So if someone said, well, let's talk about absolute truth. No, 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 you can't talk about that here. No, 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 that, that, that has a religious tone to it. Let's talk about, you know, if the possibility of a divine being did make the world. Nope, can't talk about that. It's cut off. And so suddenly our kids only have this narrow window of stuff that they can learn. Now, now before, before you walk away and go, oh, here it is. He's about to give a pitch for you should all send your kids to private Christian school. I'm not giving that pitch. Some people can't afford to send their kids to private Christian schools. I realize that. One of the greatest things I lament, one of the greatest things I lament is that Christian school is not affordable for every kid, for every Christian family. It drives me nuts. And I pray, I, I pray God raises up people to solve that problem. But understand this, just because a family can or can't send their kids to a private Christian school does not dismiss the family's job of holistic education. Ready? The family or the home is the center of wholeness. The home is the center of wholeness. Wholeness in an individual starts in the home. One time I asked my kids, uh, driving to school, I was driving to school, and I said, why do we have school? And they were clueless. I mean, it was embarrassing. I'm an educator, professional educator, and here I am driving to school. They spend 80% they spend of their waking hours from August through May at a place that they don't even know why. That's on me. That's me. They were like, uh, because you make me? I mean, like, that's the best they had. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, we, we don't understand why we have school. We don't understand the education of it. And one of the things in our culture, the cloud, we, we boiled it down to academic accomplishments. Okay. Listen, I will take a kid with a B average who is emotionally healthy, relationally healthy, spiritually healthy, and physically healthy over a 4.0 valedictorian who leaves a trail of broken relationships, emotional baggage, and rage and wrath on other people. That's biblical, my friends. That's our goal here. Holistic. We approach people holistically. And our culture has said it's, 
uh, it, you know, the education is, is in components. It's just the academic part. Now, it wasn't always that way. Keep in mind, public education in America is a baby. It's only 100 years old. You guys know that, right? You go back 100 years or so, and free public education for all kids was not a thing in America. It was each town's responsibility and the family's job. And a lot of kids, they're getting educated at their own homes. Most of education, most, most kids 200 years ago learned to count in their farm, father's uh, farm rows. Counting chickens, that's where they learned to count. They learned a lot of their stuff inside the home. Now, what happened was we had these public schoolhouses. And if you go back and look at the early public schoolhouse primers, you know where they taught kids to read from? The Bible. And it was about moral education, character education. It was intellect and character. It was a holistic education. But as our cultures become more and more secular, meaning we don't talk about religion, we don't talk about God, those character aspects have had to be removed out of it. Okay? For example, um, my uncle... We'll put it this way. If I go down to a local school and I stand up in front of, uh, you know, 500 kids at a local public school and I say, we are going to talk today about honor and character and we're going to talk about truth and honesty. Wait a second. Truth and honesty. Honesty. Why is that virtue? Why is honesty a greater virtue than cunning? Upon what grounds is that virtue higher than that? Now, you and I, it's obvious. We look at this and go, well, duh. I mean, because the Bible teaches honor and truth and God is true. And we have all of these ties and tethers to why it matters. But because our cultures move so secular, many in our education, especially our public education, they can't tie it to anything. So suddenly it becomes, I either can't go there or I can go there, but I can't tie it to anything. It has to be veiled. So if someone pushes on it, I have to let it go or else I look like I'm, I have an, a religious agenda. It's, it's a catch-22 that we find ourselves in. But that's okay. We don't panic and we don't, you know, burn down public schools and we don't pull our kids from public schools. We do what God tells us to do. But you better be darn sure that wherever you educate your kids, that the home is the center of wholeness. It's taught in the home, not at school. Even private Christian schools cannot bring everything a kid needs to be a healthy adult. John Brooks said this to me. Um, you guys don't know John Brooks, but John Brooks is my mentor. He married my wife and me. Um, when I was, he's, he's my spiritual father, okay? When I came to know the Lord, um, he was the man in Christ who fathered me and helped me begin walking in Christ. Um, John Brooks, we, you know, we go to him anytime we deal with stuff in, in our marriage, and anytime we deal with stuff in parenting, we go to him. And we sat down with John and we said this to him. We said, John, we're dealing with something with our kids and walking through this issue. And he and his wife, Kathy, they said this to us. It was profound. They said their son, their kid is named Brandon and Sarah. They, they have a boy and a girl. They're now adults and they have, you know, each have two or three kids and they're married and on all that kind of stuff. Um, and John and Kathy were talking about uh, educating their kids and growing their kids up. And we said, when do you start talking about all of these different things? And John looked at us and he said this, do you know when we begin premarital counseling with our kids? And I thought, oh, uh, I mean, like, oh, like, tw like 19, what, what, when did you, he goes, oh, we began premarital counseling the day we brought him home from the hospital by how they watch our marriage. Premarital counseling begins by when they watch what goes on in the home. What was John's point? He wasn't trying to indict anyone who's gone through a broken marriage or anything. I'm a product of a broken marriage. Okay. It's painful and difficult. Okay. But here's the deal. Watch this. When I came to know Christ, what it meant to be a godly husband and godly, in a godly marriage, I had to look outside of my home. I had to look into John's home, in John's marriage. But according to God's design, when parents know the Lord and abide in the Lord, kids should not have to look anywhere but the home to see that. That's the point. Home is the center of wholeness. One of the things I say to the eighth graders, and they hate this. You'll like it, but they hate this, okay? See how you feel about this. Um, I talk to them about honoring their siblings all the time. Barry knows. I challenge kids. I, I lead them in processes where they're required to make commitments about how they're going to love and serve their siblings. And then I'll look at my eighth graders and I'll say this. I'll say, hey, guess what? Do you know what God will, what, what your best training is for your future marriage? And they'll look at me like, what, coach? How you treat your sibling? Oh, gross, gross, that's gross, that's awkward, ooh. No, no, and I'll look at them and I'll say, listen, if you can learn to honor a sibling that you didn't choose, you will know how to honor a spouse that you did choose. 
But if all you have is bad habits toward that spouse, that sibling that you didn't choose of selfishness and jealousy and pride um, and, and apathy, well, in your low moments in your marriage, your selfishness, jealousy, pride, and apathy will show back up. So embrace living with an imperfect person because if you get married, you will have the rest of your life to do it again. The only difference is you chose that person. So home is the center of wholeness. I think I'm making my point here uh, pretty clear. So we educate kids in a healthy adulthood, but we do it inside the home, finding ways to teach economics and teach uh, fiscal stewardship and contentment and generosity and service and, you know, all these different things in healthy relational skills inside the home. Uh, one of the things that we do in our home is when our kids get in a fight, they hate this, but when they get into a fight and they're yelling back and forth, we make them go knee to knee. They hate this. They literally have to sit down and put their knees touching each other and no one can speak unless it's an admission of what they did wrong. No blame is allowed to be exchanged. They're only allowed to speak unless they admit what they did wrong. And then once they've both admitted what they did wrong, they call ma, they call a parent to us to come over and they say, oh, we, we've, we've, we've admitted what we did wrong. And I'll go, okay, what well, you tell me. And, or I'll look, I'll say, did, did they say what they did wrong? Yeah, he, he did. This is what he did wrong. And then I'll go, did you guys hug it out? Yeah, we hugged it out. Did you find a solution to this? Yeah, we found a solution. Okay, all right, go play. The reason I do that is because that's marriage, guys. Marriage is knee to knee. And if it's not knee to knee, it's lawyer to lawyer. I'll leave that there. Number three. Number three. Release whole adults. This is the goal, guys. This is the finish line. This is the win. We want to release whole adults and new families back into society. Like, release them. We want to release them. And, and, and we want to look up. I, we want to look up and we want to see this generation, like generations beyond us. I, I, there's this book. I've got this book and it talks about um, Jonathan Edwards and his wife. Uh, Jonathan Edwards. Have any of you ever seen this? The uh, documented lineage of Jonathan Edwards and his wife. They had like 11 kids. Okay. I'm not advocating that, but they had tons of kids. But when you look at a hundred years after them, they had, they had like 35 doctors 25 senators. Um, they had, uh, they had like, uh, they had a vice president. They had like 30 lawyers, uh, 40 business owners, all from their family line. And at the same time, there was a guy, they did a, this, the same book did a study and they did a genealogical study of this man who was a lifetime criminal. They did a lifetime criminal of that man and his kids. And among that family tree, there was like murderers, there was rapists, there was this, there was it. And you, have, you look at these two family lines and it ties back up to exactly what God said. God said, I will visit the blessings on generation upon generation and the curses and the difficulties will be visited on generation upon generation. God is a God of generations. And so, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, a lot of people, when, we, when I do this talk on family, a lot of people want to raise their hand and they go, okay, should the government allow this? Or should the government allow adoption between these types? Honestly, those are all governmental questions. Those aren't family questions. What I want to do and what I want to challenge us is, let's first us live out the biblical worldview of family and let's do it for 20 or 30 years. And then from that level of credibility, Let's stand with our neighbors and help our neighbors and help the people around us as they see the logical outcome of doing this, doing this God's way from an emotional pipeline to provision, to raising them up and finally to releasing them. Look what it says at releasing them. Um, you know, here in releasing them, it says, you know, for the, you know, Genesis says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and become one flesh. Here's what's broken. Okay. Here's what I see that's broken, and this isn't new in this generation, this generation of young parents. This has been handed down. What I see is I see parents that find their identity in parenting. Parent is who they are. Parent is who they are to the point that when their kid gets an A on a test, they got an A on a test. When their kid gets a college scholarship, they got a college scholarship. There's an identity marker to it, okay? It only comes from the fact that we haven't found our identity in Christ. 
And because we haven't found our identity in Christ, we've turned to performance and we've turned to the performance of our kids. You ever heard, you know, oh, that coach is just living out his old glory days. Okay. Well, that's an empty soul that hasn't found contentment inside of Christ. Therefore, they try to live out and accomplish what they could never accomplish earlier on at the expense of a younger player. Okay. I'm tempted to do that all the time. I'm a coach. I feel that temptation all the time. I have to recenter myself. When we win by 40, my acceptance is in Christ. And when we lose by 40, which we did two weeks ago, my acceptance is in Christ. Nothing has changed. In the same way in parenting, my identity is not in parenting. You know the new term that sociologists are using for parenting parents today? Anybody know what it is? Not helicopter parents. Those are parents that hover they're called snowplow parents. Snowplow parents, those of you who grew up in the North, I grew up in Ohio, snowplows were a big deal. A snowplow's job was to clear the way so people could drive easily and freely and get where they wanted to go. A snowplow parent is a parent who clears all the problems out of their kid's life. My kid has a problem with the teacher, I'll be in there to talk to the teacher. My kid has a problem with the coach, I'll be in there to talk to the coach and advocate for my kid. Now there's a time and place to advocate for our kids, but there's also a time and place to stand behind our kid and coach them in self-advocating. Because there's a lot of conversations I have with other human beings that God doesn't have for me. But God coaches me going into it. So this model of snowplow parenting where we move all the problems is not healthy. But let me, let's fast forward it, okay? We're supposed to release them. We're supposed to release them. And one of the things, okay, when you talk to par like young couples, who do they usually say they have the most tension with? Who's the biggest source of tension? for young couples, it's usually the mother-in-law. Am I wrong or right? Okay, now, and I'm saying this, and some of you are shaking your head because some of you on the call, you had great tension with your mother-in-laws, okay? I'm, I'm honestly, I'm very blessed. My mother-in-law is awesome, okay? Okay, but I, I have families, I have friends and family members who their biggest nightmare is mother-in-law. And it's not just the mother, it's not a female thing. It's sometimes it's the father-in-law, things like this. But understand this, here's where it really comes from. It comes from people who've taken their identity in parenting their kid and they've created this expectation of what the family looks like when you, I, when you grow up and you get married and you have kids. And I watch your kids three days a week and we vacation together. And we live four houses down the road from you. These the expectations that, that parents place, even Christian parents place on a newlywed couple. And these newlyweds grow up underneath their new family. The Bible calls it a new family. Listen, when I got married, when I got married, I started a new family. I am first and foremost, husband to Shannon. I am secondarily son to Kathy and Roger. My primary family is my wife. My secondary family, extended family, is my parents. And my first loyalty is to my wife, biblically. And so what this means here is my parents, if they're healthy, and they are, they are great about this, they release us. They don't pick up the phone and say, well, when I was parenting, I would have done it this way. They don't do that. They pray for us. They intercede from us from behind. I mean, they're like great high priests like Jesus, ever living to intercede, come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy for your time of need. That's what they are. They're supposed to be like Jesus on the throne to us, that we go and we seek for mercy and grace. They're not supposed to be those snowplow parents that cause pro that move problems. Um, I went to this wedding and this, I, I mean, this rocked my world. So um, you remember John Brooks and I said his son, Brandon right? His son, Brandon, I got to go to Brandon's wedding and Brandon married a girl. They met at Faith, the school that I teach at. They were a high school roommate. They were best friends in high school. They went off to Baylor. They started dating junior year. They did for a few years. Um, then they got married and um, I'm at the wedding. I mean, just incredible godly relationship leading up to that moment. Gee, I wonder where they learned it from. Both mom and both, both of the kids came from incredible godly parents and they got married and I'm standing there and it's in front of, you know, 500 people. And Gary is doing the father of the bride toast. You guys all know what it is, where, you know, weeping and crying and all that sappiness. And Gary gets up with a microphone in his hand, Gary Stats, he's the bride's dad. And he looks at his daughter, Sarah, Brandon's new wife, and he says, Sarah, Brandon, I hereby release you from any obligation to Diane, mom, and me. You are here by your own family. You have no obligation to us the rest of your life. You don't owe us anything. 
Go and obey God wherever, whenever, and however he calls you to. We bless you. I have never been and seen a more biblical, biblical marriage, wedding ceremony than that. Now there's something inside of us that hurts our heart, but like, what if they go and what, yeah, but what if God calls them to Kandahar? Are we going to hold them back? Because the job is to release them. And at the end of the day, I don't want my kids near me. I want my kids near him. And I want my kids obedient. It drives me nuts when I hear people say the safest place is in the will of God. That's absolutely one of the dumbest things anyone can ever say. It's absolutely stupid. The safest place is not in the will of God. Tell that to Paul before he got his head cut off. But the most obedient place is in the will of God. And that needs to be our goal. And we want to release them to obey. Now, in order for us to release them to obey, we must model obedience in the home. Home is the center of wholeness. So we want to create these mirrors that reflect God and truth. And, but remember what I said, guys, and I want to encourage you because some of you guys, um, um, I, I hope there's no condemnation coming out because I know everyone is here in different levels in their journey of parenting. Some of us, our parents are, our kids are grown and gone. Um, I, I don't mean any condemnation here. If you look back and go, I didn't do that right. Guys, my, my oldest is 12 and I can list 50 things I didn't do right. And if you give me five more years, I'll be able to list 50 more. I mean, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. So don't beat yourself down if you look back and go, you know what, I wish I'd done that differently. For those of you that are on the upswing of your parenting, take this, drink this in, study this, ask, what does this look like for me? How do I do this? What does this look like? Um, because I would encourage you on this. It's never too late to start. It's never too late to start. One of the most precious things I have is I've got a picture on my phone. And I don't include it in because it's a private photo for my family. But I got this picture on my phone. Remember I told you I could count on one hand the times that my dad and I and my mom, we prayed together growing up. Okay? I could count on one hand. Never. Well, it just wasn't a part. We didn't seek God together. It wasn't a, we didn't know how to. Well, my dad, is he's come to know the Lord. He walks with the Lord. He abides in the Lord. Um, about 12, 13 years ago, maybe 14 years ago, his life radically changed. Christ, I mean, met him and saved him and changed him. And now my dad takes very serious his responsibility as a grandfather and as a spiritual pipeline to point my kids to God. He takes it very seriously. And one day we're at his house. He lives in Kansas. And I go down in the basement. And it's nighttime, you know, and for those of you guys with small kids, all of you guys on this call, you know, putting kids to bed is, it's a train wreck. I mean, it is a train wreck. So I come down and, and I look and it's, I don't hear the usual chaos of kids running around, one kid's naked, swinging around underwear, you know, I mean, I, it's a, usually a train wreck and it's all quiet downstairs. And my dad said he'd put the kids to bed this night. Okay. And I walk down the stairs and I look and there are five, my five little ducklings sitting on the couch, little small little butts, they can sit on the couch. And my dad is down on his knees and he's holding them by the hands and he's leading them in prayer. And I began to weep. And I gathered myself and took a picture of it. Something I never experienced with my dad, my, grand, my kids, his grandkids get to experience. See, they don't know a day without grandpa walking with Jesus. I can't remember a day growing up when he did. It's never too late to start. And it's not my dad's job to disciple my kids, but my dad becomes an echoing voice of my voice by echoing the lordship of Jesus and what, he, what my kids are hearing from me and from my wife. So guys, this is a pretty serious deal. When we look at society, we look, it's easy for us as Christians to look out the window and go, wow, it's all a mess. It's terrible. It's a mess. Guys, you know, the scripture says judgment begins and it begins where? With the household of God. Let's look at ourselves first. Are we getting our functions right in the family? If we are not, it makes it really hard for us to look and prophetically speak to our culture not only about Christ, but also about the way of family. Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for spending the time with me, okay? Thanks, Coach. Have a great night. Thank Appreciate you. it.